Hi, my name is Coke with BlackDome.com, and I'm here with McKinley Belcher, the third star of HBO's We Own This City. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. I want to say something before we start. Okay. McKinley is so kind. You know, I, I did an interview with one of his, his colleagues, uh, Lucas Van Ingen, and McKinley just said, you know what? Good job. That was a great interview. I said, child, like, <laughs> I don't even know this man. <laughs> he never had no, to say I, hi I really or bye. <laughs> The art of a great interview and someone who's actually interested in the person. It was beautiful. Uh, I really appreciate that. So, you know, I got to hit you with some questions, too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing crazy, I promise. Um, so I understand that you are originally from Atlanta. I am, ATL. You are born in Grady Hospital. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know all about Grady. Grady, baby. <laughs> I, know the, I know about the Grady <laughs> babies. I, I know the rumors. I actually went to school in Atlanta. Um, well, well, I went to, um, to college in Atlanta, so I'm, I'm familiar with the landscape. Where'd you go? I went to Clark Atlanta. Okay. So I know about the AUC and stuff, but I know that you went to Belmont University. I did, yes. In yes. Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> in Nashville. Yes. But then, um, from what I'm understanding, you went to school and you studied political science, so it doesn't seem like acting was necessarily your expected trajectory. No, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> for, for Since probably like middle school, I was always saying I was going to go to law school and be an attorney. Really? So, yes. Uh, so even when I was at Belmont, uh, I was studying political science and uh, I was interning at a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> and even when I finished, uh, I started working as a, a sort of a, a legal assistant, paralegal at a firm in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And that was like going to be my gap year before I went to law school. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, I sort of discovered in that <laughs> gap year that I didn't want to be an attorney. <laughs> really? So what, what about being an attorney just didn't seem to suit your fans anymore? Is it, is it just all the, the paperwork or...? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I was grateful for that time uh, interning at a law firm in Nashville because I got to see a bunch of different practices and mm -hmm. people practicing very different types of law. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was working in Atlanta, I won't say the name of the law firm, mm -hmm. but I was sort of assisting two different attorneys who were very accomplished and very good at what they did, but they were very unhappy. Mm. And, uh, they, they, I, there were all kinds of hours they were spending at work away from their families. And I had this moment where I was thinking like, like they're miserable. Uh, and so if I'm going to do this, I have to find something worth being miserable for. Mm -hmm. and that probably sounds crazy, but like, there's like a shadow side to every job. So yeah. like, I feel like if you're going to endure that shadow side, then like the, the, it has to be worth it for you. And for, for, for whatever reason, uh, in my mind, law wasn't worth it. So I had to think of something that would be worth it. Mm -hmm. And the last time I felt fulfilled in a way that would be worth it was doing one play that I did in undergrad, uh, Raising in the Sun. <laughs> that was the first time that you ever acted at that point? First time I had ever acted in life. I was probably really? like 19. Really? Yeah. But then you were on the speech team too. I was, yeah. Okay, I need to do me, research. <laughs> I'll just talk to people, you know what I'm saying? We got to have something to talk about, you know? I'm not going to ask like, what's your favorite color? I want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, uh, because I was interested in being an attorney, I, I originally joined the speech and debate team for to, like, get some practice with, like, parliamentary debate and sort of a, a debate and sort of using logic on my feet. Right. Um, but there's a whole other side of it that's, like, individual events and, like, more interpretive things, like mm -hmm. prose and dramatic interpretation and duo and those are more creative and, and interpretive so I, I got a chance to sort of get a little peek into acting before i even realized i was interested mm -hmm. and, and it turned out i excel far more at that than i did at the parliamentary debate <laughs> that's very interesting because i, I yeah. actually think of when i think about someone that's interested in, in law i think of law as being somewhat creative in a sense i do think there's a part of it where you have to be persuasive and you have for to sure. really capture people so i i don't think it's unusual for you to find a path in acting necessarily yeah, especially yeah. when you get in, in like to a lot of litigation, and uh, uh, the joy of my job is I get to play attorney sometimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, what if you would have gone the path of attorney? What kind of law do you think you would have chose to practice? That's a good question. Um, what I was toying with then mm -hmm. was um, either some entertainment law, which mm -hmm. is what my mentor was when I was in undergrad. Um, or some sort of litigation, uh, and, and that could be a, a number of different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and listen, and we're we're talking about uh, HBO's We Own This City, and in this particular show is it's really, really quite heavy. We are talking about the law, <laughs> yeah. going against what what should be lawful, and and making decisions that are are very, very you know precarious, and um, you you just never know, right? So yeah. talking about your character, uh, Mamadou G Money, you know, you know who is G Money, and, and what kind of detect or actually. What is he? What kind of person is he? <laughs> okay. 
uh, uh, Mamadou Gondo, aka G Money, is uh, <laughs> one of the detectives on the GTTF, the Gun Trace Task Force in mm -hmm. uh, Baltimore. And uh, like personality wise, I think of him as like a really charismatic dude who like uh, enjoys a good time and uh, is very good at looking out for himself. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But but the reason he's in this story is because uh, he was one of the most corrupt uh, members of this task force and was one of the seven that got caught in um uh, eventually put in jail because of the the, the deeds and the the abuse and mm -hmm. corruption that they uh, took part in over the course of probably like seven or eight years. Right. And I, I think it's really interesting when you watch this story, because a lot of times I think a lot of people aren't really aware that there are people in this world that it exists in a plane or a space that the police really are a constant threat to their existence. Mm -hmm. you, know, you see examples of this in the show where people are just really just minding their business and they yeah. cannot get through anything. And there's a really, really there's a point in the show where a man literally cashed a paycheck and it was just like the police just took everything from him. And that one sort of bump in the road changed everything in his life. It was just that critical, you know. So yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it was really important for me to tell the story mm -hmm. is because like I'm a black man in America and uh my Fourth Amendment rights have been trampled on many a time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, and, and it's not limited to one city or one state. Like I, I've lived in, I've lived in LA, I've lived in Nashville, lived in Atlanta, I've lived in mm -hmm. New York and Jersey, and it's happened in all these places. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, uh, more uh, severe than others, mm -hmm. uh, but because this is a thing that people experience and a thing that disrupts people's lives, and a thing that Black parents have to sit their children down and try to like sort of sit them out and say, "This is how you handle this when it happens. This mm -hmm. is how." You, you protect your own life. Uh, I felt like it was really important to highlight this story mm -hmm. and to tell it with uh, like a really uh, keen eye for the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a, a, another thing that I that I noticed when I was watching this story is that, you know, I think, and I, and I say this often, like everybody kind of has an origin story, you know, things sort of start from a place. And yeah. some, of, some of these cops weren't necessarily looking to be these kind of people. But you know, mm -hmm. you've got Sergeant Wayne Jenkins. He just kind of pushes and pushes and pushes, and it's sort of like, well, let me get my piece of the pie. So then everybody, yeah. it, it's like it's like a cancer, right? And it just spreads, and then everybody just becomes a part of this thing. Because if you don't do it, then you can't be a sort of a part of the circle. So you see, like how you know, there's one thing. I mean, you know, people are followers in, in life, but I mean, in something like this, where it's really life or death, where someone's being a follower, where it's affecting lives, it's a very dangerous thing we're talking about. It is. Mm -hmm. It's like it, it reminds me of like. In, in 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 a time where we're talking a lot about like what prejudice is, what bias is, and how mm -hmm. that lives in institutions and in many different parts of our lives, uh, a lot of people like to think of themselves themselves as exempt from that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a firm believer: if you think you are exempt, you are likely part of the problem. Mm -hmm. like, and, and, and in my mind, a, a lot of what the, a lot of these guys did, they, they weren't out to sort of fail their community or to hurt people. What mm -hmm. they did, they put blinders on. Mm -hmm. And they just focused on what they needed, mm -hmm. and they went after what they needed, and didn't think about what 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 that meant, or how it affect people around them, or how would it affect the 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 the, the vows they took in terms of like what they would do as police mm -hmm. officers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think it's very easy to sort of play these guys as and or paint these guys as monsters, but the reality is most of them are just regular dudes. They're somebody's son. They're somebody's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. They're somebody's husband. Mm -hmm. Somebody looks at those guys and thinks they're great people or at least they thought they were when they didn't know what was going on. Uh, and so it's exciting to me to get to sort of tell this story and like they absolutely failed themselves, the police department and their communities. But like the fact that they're just regular people sort of points to it not just being a few bad apples. It's an institutional thing. Exactly. It's a thing where the system itself is broken. Yes. Like the, the way they're trained, the, the way they're encouraged and incentivized, it's all broken and needs to be sort of built up from the ground up. Absolutely. That's a, that's an excellent point. And I think also to add to your point, you know, we are all like a sum of parts, right? So just like mm -hmm. you said, you know, I mean, I can go out into the world and somebody might think I'm completely amazing. Then I go into another woman. It's just like this horrible person, you know, when she's working with me, I don't like this person, you know, so it's, it's just, it's just try to understand that, you know, we're like, it's a dichotomy. You just really yeah. don't know how people present to other people. That's why even in you saying that, um, I never blindly vouch for anybody. I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's not fair. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't like to reduce people's experiences with other people. And yeah. I might think someone is an amazing person, but I'm not here to discount 
what someone else's experience is. They're like, well, now I hang out with Bob. He's wonderful. I don't know what you're talking about. That's, that's not fair because you really no. don't know what someone else's experience is. I think that's, a, that's quite an interesting point. Um, another really interesting point in, the, like, in watching this show is watching the community had such a distrust for the police. It was even difficult to find people to sit on the jury. I mean, everybody yeah. just had a story, you know, just everybody. It didn't matter you know, how old, how young. Everybody had something that they had went through. It's crazy when you think how just deep the ramifications of when people do these things. It's like you, you can do the horrible thing of like the, the short sighted thing of like, oh, I'm just going to do this for a come up for some money. And it happens over the course of weeks. Mm -hmm. But like the, 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 the hurt, the trauma, the distrust, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the breakdown of relationships that that takes years to repair. And, and you the action only took a couple days or a couple weeks. That's, so that, that's true. Just crazy when you think about that. That is so true. And I just want to talk about even just Baltimore as a landscape. Like what was your what was it like your time there and speaking to the Baltimore people? Um, just really kind of researching your role and just sort of taking in the culture. How did you how did you find Baltimore to be? Yeah, I I, I had not spent a lot of time in Baltimore beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to D.C. a bunch, but mm -hmm. that's the closest I spent like a significant amount of time. Uh, so when I got there, I was so glad I got there early. And mm -hmm. uh, you can just feel the energy. Like I said, obviously, it's a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. And the people in it are also beautiful. And uh, one thing I was struck by, like... Um, interacting with people on set is that mm -hmm. a lot of the extras, uh, the officers who were assisting us in uh, sort of uh, consulting, mm -hmm. uh, crew, people who walking by, like they all in some way been affected by this unit. Mm. Uh, and, and they often knew these people by name. Oh, like, wow. I, I remember I was in one scene and, and the extra who was sitting there, he was like, I went to high school with him. Or, or like, I live next door to him. So like, mm -hmm. it, aside from the people that I met who like were there to like actually help me understand what it is that I was doing. Uh, just like living alongside of shooting a thing, I was learning constantly about like, it's one thing to absorb information, but another thing to absorb um, how people's lives are impacted, uh, what it means to the community for the story to be told and be mm -hmm. told in an honest way. Uh, I feel like a lot of my prep was, I mean, I did some of like sort of the studious things of like reading Justin Fenton's book, uh, mm -hmm. We Own the City. And there was another book, um, I Got a Monster, that was also about the GTTF. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they also gave us body cam footage so we could see the guys working and like some phone calls that were recorded. Uh, so I got to hear and see them work. Uh, and I found that really valuable. But but I think I was there for like three or four months and uh I just felt like it was a, I was honored to be there. And mm -hmm. like, I was telling a story that was not only important to me, but important to everyone around me. And, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I want to like sort of shift back to, to you again, because just seeing how you take you know, research seriously and just understanding your roles and respecting um, your art. Um, we talked about your undergrad, but you're, you have your MFA as well. I do. From USC. So now, now we now we went from political science, and then you shifted uh -huh. to something that specifically was focused on the arts. How did we get there? So that one play that I did in undergrad, mm -hmm. um, uh, A Raising the Sun. Uh, shout out to Crystal Jones who like wrote me into doing that. <laughs> shout out to Crystal <laughs> Jones. <laughs> um, uh, the director of that play was like, you know, you should think seriously about doing this beyond school. Isn't that uh, something? You know what? You should apply to NYU for the grad program. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she said that, I was like, uh, I'm, "No, I'm I'm going to law school." You, just, <laughs> you just, uh, uh, but it sort of it was filed away in the back of my head. So when I had that moment when I was sitting at the desk uh, thinking about the attorney who I was working for, mm -hmm. um, I thought back to that that moment that she said it. So like mm -hmm. as I'm sitting there at my desk, I'm googling uh, NYU grad programs, and, <laughs> uh, and uh, that day. I started my application for NYU's uh, a grad acting program. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my audition was, this is a long story. Uh, my audition was in Chicago uh, mm -hmm. in the middle of winter. And uh, I was sitting there waiting for my audition. And uh, the the way they do it is it's like in at a hotel. So like, they're like maybe six or seven schools in, oh, in a hallway uh, oh. who are all auditioning right next to each other. And next door to NYU was USC. And so I was having a conversation with one of the recruitment people from USC and we, I was sitting there for a while. So we talked for maybe 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm one of those people that if 
I'm very bad at small talk. So I end up having very <laughs> in-depth conversations with people about like deep parts of their lives that they don't actually show the strangers. Me too. <laughs> but we had this deep conversation. He was like, you should really audition for USC. But I was like, I didn't, uh, I didn't pay that. I didn't come here for that, yeah. Forget the application fee. Like uh, when you finish with NYU, just come over and then I'll, I'll put you through. And I was like, all right, <laughs> I'm here <laughs> as well. <laughs> and and uh, it, it turned out that like I had a much even, even deeper connection to the people who were teaching at USC. Really? And they brought me back a couple months later to come to the campus and stay for like a sort of workshop. Mm -hmm. And um, I got like a full fellowship there. So I ended up going to school the, the following year. Wow. So I yeah. mean, in all your travels, because you said you've lived a lot of places, where would you say that you feel? I mean, of course, Atlanta is home, but where do you feel most at home, if that is home at all? Um, uh, New York. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, New York feels the, like the most home. Uh, mm -hmm. That that feels like home now. And, and why is that? Because I love New York, the culture, right? It's. A... <laughs> yeah. and it... I, I love. I'm a pretty direct person, so I appreciate <laughs> people who are yeah. who are direct and yeah. not sort of uh, very baroque about how they uh, <laughs> veil their feelings. Uh, but like, I feel like the arts community there yes. is so diverse, and there's so many different things. Uh, to experience and to jump into. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm an actor and a writer, but I also enjoy the visual arts and all kinds yes. of other things. Um, I, I I like not having to drive. <laughs> <laughs> of course, right. <laughs> Probably is an option. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true, it's true. And that's a blessing in my mind. Um, yeah, I, I, I really dig it. Yeah, New York is a good place. I, for, for, for me, I enjoy the on-camera stuff and I enjoy doing theater as well. And like mm -hmm. New York is best places to be if you enjoy being on stage. That's true. So, I mean, there's, there's, is there a, a kind of a, a fear when you get on stage and you do the live theater or you're just, you're in it? Like that first Raisin in the Sun just prepared you and... Because <laughs> uh, you don't get to do over when you're doing a play. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. Like, <laughs> it, it it's sort of like jumping off a cliff. Yeah. And, uh, and you sort of have to surrender to the process of like, you've done the work and you just sort of like let yourself fall into and uh, be enveloped by the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Like. I feel like my training at USC was mainly theater based and like my reason for doing it in the first place was I thought I would be doing more theater than anything. So like uh, it's definitely my first love. So uh, it's a thing every time I get a chance to do, I, I, I feel very fulfilled and filled up like my cup runneth over. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it, there is a little bit of fear each time, but like that fear in some ways is thrilling. Yeah, I, I can understand that. I know, I know yeah. what that feeling. Yeah, and and yeah. when did you when did you feel like you kind of made it? Like you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. like, or, or or are you often? Do you find yourself recognized often, or does it depend on where you are? Uh, uh that's interesting because like the, the <laughs> pandemic has sort of changed that because we're wearing masks all the time. So <laughs> I, 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 I'm like, oh, this is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, before the pandemic, I did find that like, because you get you get on some shows and like that are really popular, like Ozark or something right, like right. that. Um, and, and there was a time where the passage was on and people were like really hyped about that. Um, so people do stop me every now and for those, and mainly at like airports and gyms, <laughs> and, and which really? is like really, yeah, really. Uh, uh, and in the restroom, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> Give me give a me second. second. <laughs> Hilarious. But, but yeah. But I mean, it's like you're. I mean, I, I have to say it again. You're just so kind, and um, I find, and I t I tell people this that that offer kindness to me. I'm like, you know, it's so interesting how people that probably can afford to sort of be jerks never really are. It's mm. always, you know what I mean? Like it's always yeah. a person who's just. You never see that from people that that have that sort of room. Where like, okay, well, you know, that person that sort has made it, you know, but they're never mean to me ever. It's always somebody that's just so obnoxious that's just not. They don't have a reason to be, and I just find that quite interesting. I think kindness is a beautiful thing, and I always just I embrace do too. it. Mm -hmm. I feel like we should all lead with that. Mm -hmm. uh, sincerely, though. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sincerely. <laughs> uh, I I didn't answer your question about the the, the making it thing though, because yes. I, I want to. Uh, uh, I don't feel like exactly like I've made it. I feel like my version of making it would be that like, I feel like I have creative control, mm. some degree of creative control over what it is that I do on a day to day. Mm -hmm. And that uh, there are like 
offers coming through, not necessarily things that I have to audition and sort of prove myself to get. And I, I'm still in the place. I mean, every now and then I get an offer, but, right. but most of the things that I do, the thing I'm here doing in, in Cape Town right now, um, I have to audition for. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's a, it's a, 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 not, I wouldn't say grueling, but it is a, a sort of step-by-step -step sort of like having to prove myself each and every yeah. way. And, and in some ways I'm grateful for that because mm -hmm. there's something about it that feels like that's not something that can be taken away because it's been earned slowly and yeah. like, you've earned it. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like when I, whenever I do get to a place, if I get to a place where I feel like I've made it, I'll, I'll appreciate it more because it, it's been like a, a journey to get there. Yeah, it's a journey, but you've had some very, very solid roles along the way and you've worked very consistently. I mean, I think the beauty of it really, and like you said, I mean, I, I think that's a very interesting uh, distinction that you said because there's one thing's like, hey, we got 50 scripts in front of you. Which one do you care to do? Like, okay, well, right. this summer I'll do this. Now, that's that's very different. Um, yeah. But but like you, like you said, that feeling of knowing that maybe 50 people went out for this role and I got it. That has to just feel so good to know that I was the one for this role. So I can imagine the, the joy in that. It does. Mm -hmm. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, you know, like you don't have to necessarily have a so-called day job in the sense that a lot of people are they're working actors, but they're working and acting. I think, you know, it's a beautiful thing that you can say solidly, this is what I do. <laughs> You know. That is a blessing. <laughs> I, I, I haven't had to have a day job in a very long time, mm -hmm. uh, so I can confidently say uh, <laughs> acting, and and hope and hopefully I can say even more so writing someday. Uh, yes, it, it is how I I make my living. Is there anybody that that decided to study law, and I know you can write, so <laughs> 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 it'll be very very interesting. What 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 will come from that pen from you? Um, so do you want to talk about the project that you're working on now, or any other projects that you have coming out in the future? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I'm in Cape Town, South Africa right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, first, I just have to say that it's been such a beautiful experience. Everybody uh, loves it. Walking around Cape Town and mm -hmm. seeing all these beautiful and brown faces yes. uh, with very different experiences than mine. Um, mm -hmm. like, I, their hearts are so open and I felt very embraced while I've been here. And that's like not even talking about my job. It's like just my experience being in the city, in this mm -hmm. country, uh, on this continent. Uh, but the, the project I'm doing is for Netflix. It's mm -hmm. uh, a live action adaptation of a Japanese manga anime called One Piece. Mm. Uh, I'm basically playing the the Thanos of that universe or of, of, of the first season. The mm -hmm. character's name is Arlong. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, up, a, up until like maybe just before we own this city, I often got cast as like the, the nice guy and like the guy <laughs> who... Uh, everyone likes and who's doing good. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's been really interesting for me in the last year or two to get to sort of play on the dark side a little bit mm -hmm. and to experiment with playing characters um, who are in some ways broken and um, like sometimes it's often linked to some kind of trauma and they're trying to find their way through that and it manifests itself in different ways. And I just find like that offers an opportunity to find a different kind of depth to the work that I do. And that's exciting mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. I had another question for you because you, you brought up an interest in music, but I wasn't sure what that meant. Are you playing music? Are you singing? I was just curious. Oh, say it again? Like you brought up an interest in music. I saw in another interview, you were talking to somebody, you said you had an interest in music. So I said, is he singing? Oh, yeah. Just, are you singing? I, I do sing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has come up as an actor a couple of times. And I hope it continues to come up because it's something mm -hmm. I enjoy exploring. Uh, it makes me nervous sometimes, but I, I do enjoy it. But but I, I also play the sax. So okay. uh, jazz and blues and um, classical music and everything in between is all very um, important and um, it fills me up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something else that I, I hope comes to play in the acting thing. I would love to play like a jazz musician or something where I get to sort of explore uh, my journey with the sax in addition to my journey with acting. Now, that would be exciting to me. That's amazing. I played the sax in fourth grade, but I just it just oh, wasn't. Yeah? It, it, it was too heavy. I was like <laughs> practicing. Everybody in the house telling me to shut up. I was I played enough. Good enough. I was in the band. Was it an alto or tenor? It was an alto. Okay. It was just too much. I, you know, that, that, <laughs> that was a, it was just a moment in time, you know. So yeah. yeah. But uh, but I can relate to that. And then the reads, and it was like my teeth were all messed yeah. up. Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, God. I feel like it's one of those things that it's like either for you or like <laughs> it was not, not for me. Not, not I, 
I heard a, a guy play in church when I was like seven mm-hmm. or eight. And as so, I heard him play a couple times. And I was like, I want to play that. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then so since I was like maybe 11, I've been playing since then. Um, wow. Yeah. That's- so I, it, it would be really beautiful to get to do, whether it's on stage or on camera. Uh, I feel like that's going to be a very special moment for me when, when those two worlds collide. I would love to see that because I had not heard you really speak more about the music in that sense. So now we huh. know. So I'm going to make yeah, sure yeah. that we talk about this sex. <laughs> <laughs> I would love and that. Go ahead. I, I wanted to say that uh, when, I, when I finish this, uh, I'm finally going to get to come back to the stage again. Mm. Uh, I, I'm so proud of the the, the project that it's going to be in because um, it is, uh, it's going to be on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, a, a production of Death of a Salesman, um, but it'll be the first time on Broadway that is told through the lens of an African American family. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, Wendell Pierce, one of the guys from The Wire, is mm-hmm. going to play the father. And this beautiful British actress, uh, Sharon Clark, um, is the mother. And and uh, a guy who I did a, a play with um, off Broadway about a bunch, bunch of boxers. His name is Chris Davis. We're going to play brothers. Um, but I, I'm just so excited about. Um, getting to tackle this play with this group of people. And um, there's something about telling stories on stage and on, on film. It's like where you prop a story up and you're saying this is important. Yeah. And uh, it's exciting to me to get to sort of tell this story and say this family and their experience in 1940s and uh, the, 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 the journey and the struggle of being who they are in the world that's sort of pressing on them in this way is important. Mm-hmm. And uh, very much looking forward to it. I am very much looking forward to it as well. I am. It's been such a pleasure and an honor to speak to you. I, I thank you so much for your time. And again, I thank you for your kindness. Thank you. That is something that we need more of in this world. Yes, he do. got this, despite playing the saxophone, he got these beautiful teeth. When I, <laughs> <laughs> when, I played it, <laughs> when I played it, it did not work out that well for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, again, my name is Coco with BlackFilm.com. And of course, I'm here with McKinley Belcher, the third star hey. of HBO's We Own This City. Um, the season finale is on Monday. And I'm yes. so happy for you. I mean, look at you. I mean, he's just casually, you know, in Cape Town shooting the movie. You know how it goes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we out here. <laughs> I can't wait to see you like, it's McKinley! <laughs> On the subway, you're like, girl, calm down. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. It's been such a pleasure. You're a really beautiful person. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you want to see more content like this on blackfilm.com, make sure you like, subscribe, and ring that bell.